In the beginning, there was very few buttons, because knobs ruled the world. But from these rotary knobs, the stick was born, and this gave rise to the buttons. But the thing about buttons is they multiply and spread. First there was one, then two, then six, and soon 18 was made available to the hands of gamers and Atari fans across the world. As you can tell, we're talking about controllers. More specifically, the evolution of controllers across Atari consoles. These things began simply, but soon gave way to designs and creations that were strange, unique, and maybe even a little painful. I'm the 7800 Pro Gamer for the Atari Network, and today I invite you to take a look at the evolution of the Atari controller, from Pong all the way to the new VCS. So let's begin. As you probably guessed, we're talking about controllers for home consoles. Arcades had a variety of control methods seemingly from the start, but the home started in some very strange ways. They started with laying games right off the consoles themselves. And this is where Atari's Pong at Home starts. You are expected to not only play with the consoles close to you, but with it in between two players sharing the unit to control your paddles. These knobs were rotary controls meant to allow you to move a paddle up and down on a screen. And while it made sense, it definitely was inconvenient. But it's forgivable, as this was the first, and there was really only one game to worry about playing. But it wasn't long at all before things like Ultra Pong was released, with controllers that could be lifted out of the unit and held in the hand for better comfort. These were mostly oblong, but this helped to be able to hold the controller in one hand, while leaving the other available to rotate the knob. These controllers were usually hardwired into the unit, meaning that they could not be replaced easily should anything happen. But this was just the beginning, and soon Atari would embrace the idea of interchangeable cartridges that would allow for people to play many different games with a simple swap of a cartridge. The video computer system, or VCS, hit the market and brought an arcade favorite home, the joystick. This joystick rested atop a square, and it was as stiff as could be. Well, at first anyway, with a little use and some time, it seemed to loosen up just a bit. You could use this stick to move a variety of characters and items across your television set. People were not happy with just controlling a paddle and hitting a ball anymore. Now, with the fabled joystick, they could control tanks, airplanes, spaceships, uh, squares, eyeballs, vague interpretations of people, and so much more. There could be grand adventures and intense arcade action brought right to the home. But just moving your character wasn't enough. They needed some form of interaction, whether it be firing a laser or shooting a cannon, or even just picking up and dropping items. So a button was placed on the controller, and the world rejoiced as this button opened things up a lot for gameplay. It was simple, yes, and I'm embellishing a bit, but it was an advancement in controllers nonetheless. The joystick and button combination was iconic for the VCS, which of course was eventually dubbed the 2600. But there was another controller made available from the start and needs to be mentioned in the evolution of Atari controllers. Because people still wanted to be able to play Pong style games. So the paddle controller was also included with the 2600 and would allow for two paddles per controller port for a total of four on a single console. Where previous versions of Pong controllers had a large knob similar to that found on televisions cosmetically the paddles were sleek and looked like one continuous piece of plastic, if you didn't know better. But the top ridges could be grabbed and turned just like any previous knob, and people used this simple idea to expand on the paddle game genre. Four-player paddle games like Warlords came to the 2600, along with unique adventures like Demons to Diamonds and Canyon Bomber and hectic, addictive gameplay like Kaboom. The paddles were an evolution of the Pong controls, but also happened to be the end of the line of such things on Atari consoles. There was also other controllers available for the 2600. Trackballs come to mind. But today we're just covering the controllers that came with units and were most common with Atari consoles. So it's time we move on from the 2600 to its successor in the 5200. And the 5200 might have been double that of the 2600, but Atari didn't want to just double the buttons on their new controller. They decided to add two fire buttons on each side of their new stick, for a total of four, but they could only ever do the same functions on either side. 
This is already an impressive upgrade from the single button of the 2600, but Atari wasn't done yet. You had a number pad in the center of the new unit, with buttons numbered 0 through 9 along with the pound and hashtag. But, before we move on to the joystick itself, let's talk about the last three buttons on the 5200 controller, as these were probably some of the smartest and biggest upgrades from the previous model. The 5200 joystick, or the CX-52, had pause, reset, and select removed from the console and placed on the topmost portion of the new controller. This was an incredible idea, as you no longer had to keep the console close to perform these functions. You could leave it near the television and play on the couch. Well, that is if the cord wasn't so short. Seems odd they would add this convenience, but still stick players to sitting on top of the unit, tethered by these really short cords. But change isn't always easy, and comes in small iterations sometimes. The joystick itself was much shorter than the previous one, but the new joystick did not self-center. The 5200 used an analog joystick that allowed for very precise movement. The controller was incredibly cutting edge in some ways, but had a lot of issues. It was prone to failure in the triggers as well as the pause, reset, and select buttons. The non-centering joystick also caused issues for some games, but the reliability was by far the worst aspect. The number pad also proved to be a poor concept for controlling games, but I guess it was good for dialing phones. So Atari moved away from the CX-26 controller of the Atari 2600 and the CX-52 of the 5200 and took a new direction. I'd like to welcome you all to the Pro System, a console designed for the advanced game player. And a Pro System needs a Pro controller. So let me introduce you to the Pro line. This baby has a whopping two buttons and a nice large joystick while maintaining the lovely shape of the 5200 controller. No more number pad though, and no more non-centering joystick. But there also wasn't the convenience of pause, start, and select from the controller itself. They were moved back to the console. The controller design was very much informed by the console's backwards compatibility with the 2600, but we aren't here to talk about that. For all intents and purposes, this controller was a step backwards from the 5200. Well, except for in quality, the Pro line did not have the issues of the CX-52, and that was good. But it's earned the nickname of Pain Line for a reason. Prolonged use leads to pain in the wrists and a burning sensation in the forearms. Definitely not a great feature. But little did us Yanks know, 7800 owners across the pond got the true evolution of Atari's controllers in the form of the gamepad. The gamepad still had only two buttons, but was much more comfortable to use and play with. The buttons were positioned on the right of a rectangular base, and they allowed for two functions to be used. There was a directional pad on the left that replaced the joystick that Atari had used for, well, about three consoles now. But for those who just couldn't say goodbye to the joystick, a thumbstick could be screwed into the D-pad for increased comfort. This controller was comfortable, especially compared to the Pro line, and it was comparable to what the competition was bringing in from Japan in the Far East. If only America had received this little gem, but it wasn't meant to be, and we have to move on to the next evolution. Atari released its last console for quite some time, and that came in the form of the Atari Jaguar. The Jaguar was the world's first, quote, 64-bit, unquote, console, and it needed a complex and unique controller to handle the games. So in came a design originally meant for the Atari ST, with 18 unique buttons and a truly unique design. If there's one thing you can say, Atari did not try to imitate what anybody else on the market was doing, for better or for worse. The number pad made a return and was plopped on the bottom center of this beast. There was three angled action buttons on the right, a step up from the two of the 7800 gamepad. You also had two buttons in the center for start and select, and the now industry standard D-pad on the left hand side. This thing was large, massive even, but it did mold to the hands nicely. Unfortunately, there was no real comfortable way to use the number pad, and it made controlling some games overly complicated, especially if you didn't have access to the included overlays. Much like the rest of the Jaguar, this controller came and went with little fanfare, and it made no real impact on the industry. The number pad was a thing of the past, especially when the Jaguar came out, but Atari stubbornly hung on to it for reasons many of us cannot understand. It would be some time before we saw the latest, and as of now, final evolution of Atari's controllers. But before we get into that, I'd like to remind you all to like and subscribe. We put out two videos a week, just like this one. And please, consider joining our Discord server if you want to continue the discussion after this video. Link in the description. 
Okay, so it would be over 20 years before the next, and to this point, last iteration of Atari's controllers came out. But it was time well spent as we entered the modern age, full of some of the most comfortable designs for controllers that we've ever seen. Atari released its Atari VCS 800, a set-top box that came with two controllers. First, there's the modern controller, and it's something very similar to what its competition uses. This 12-button controller ditches the number pad, and uses four phase buttons in a pattern similar to what PlayStation and Xbox uses. There are three buttons in the center, usually reserved for start, select, and returning to the home menu. You also have two bumpers and two triggers on the very top. This controller shares a ton in common with the Xbox controller, not only in design, but in its shape as well. You also have two thumbsticks and a round disc that is essentially a D-pad. It works well for games that follow a modern design philosophy, and for games that need two thumbsticks for aiming and moving. But Atari is a company that is perpetually celebrating its past, and for that, you need a controller that's just a little bit different. Enter the Classic Controller, a modern take on the CX-26, or the one-button joystick that started it all. We did discuss the Pong stuff, but this was the first joystick and button combination that was so iconic and useful for a variety of game types. You still have the joystick in the center and the button on the square base, but there are some new and smart design elements. First, you have a single bumper on the left-hand side that allows for two-button games to be compatible, like those for the 7800 as an example. You also have two buttons below the joystick that usually serve as pause and select, along with a menu button on the opposite side of the usual button placement. But the biggest innovation has to be the ability to twist the joystick to allow for paddle controls. So it does call back to Pong as well. Atari thought of it all. But seriously, this thing is perfect for controlling classic games, and when used in combination with the modern controller, you have a duo of wireless controllers for any occasion. And that represents the full evolution of Atari controllers to this day. Well, the controllers that are packed in with consoles and are required to enjoy the minimum amount of content on the consoles. There have been various trackballs over the years, as well as adapters, controller holders for twin stick games, and even racing controllers that are almost exactly like the paddles, with some minor changes. And maybe we'll look at those in the future if there's a demand for it. But I want to hear your opinions on the controllers we just discussed. Which is your favorite and why? Is there any of them that you really dislike? Let me know these things and more in the comments down below. I'd also like to take this time to thank my Patreons. Without their support, the Atari network would not be able to cover as much as it does. These people keep the network growing and going strong. So thank you all very much. And please consider becoming a Patreon yourself. I'll have a link in the description below. Also, I sell merch if you're interested. And don't forget to catch our live shows. Every other Friday, we have the Atari Network Podcast, where you can get the latest and greatest news and going-ons with our favorite consoles and hobbies. It's at 7.30 p.m. Eastern Time, 4.30 Pacific. And also catch Man vs. 7800 on the opposite Saturdays. I try to complete every Atari 7800 game I can get my hands on, and I always try my best to beat them, even if I haven't yet. Join us at 11 a.m. Eastern Time, 8 Pacific, every other Saturday, for Man vs. 7800. Okay guys, I hope you enjoyed our look at the evolution of Atari controllers. It was a lot of fun to talk about and go over, and I hope to catch you in the next video. But until then, please remember to stay classy, Atarians.